This is the Get a Life Podcast. X Cult Conversations. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Get a Life Podcast here in the UK. I'm here with my friends Anne and Ross and Gilly, and our special guest is with us here today is Stephen. Um, good evening, Stephen. Good evening. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. good. Okay, so Stephen, you left the um, Plymouth Brethren Christian Church about 13 years ago. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we just start at the very beginning and you tell us why you left and what happened and a little bit about your story. Well, I don't think we've got time tonight. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, no, so, yeah, I I actually struggled with it, even as a, as a teenager, really. Uh, when I was 16, I asked, well, I didn't ask my father. I said to him on the way back from the meeting one evening when we were all together as a family in the car, and I said, um, I really, I'm sorry to say it, but I really don't think it's for me. I don't really have that much interest in the religious side of things. And my dad scared me into staying. And he looked in the rearview mirror and he leaned forward and he said, mm -hmm. if you leave, you may never return. Wow. Mm. And you were 16 at that point. Yeah. yeah. And how, how right he was. <laughs> and when I did leave, um, I'll never go back. Yeah. How did that make you feel at 16 years old? That's quite strong, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I was frightened to death. Um, mm. And it was a bit ridiculous of me to even consider leaving at 16 mm. when I didn't really have anything behind me and certainly no experience to be able to leave. You know, there was nothing for me on the outside world. Um, and so I stayed and thought, I can, I can do this. Um, but clearly, I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so presumably you were still at school at that point. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And latterly, it was probably two years before I finally left that I was really struggling with life inside, as it were. And. Obviously, I was married then with two lovely children, and mm. I never left for the bright lights of the outside world. I left because I couldn't cope with life inside. Mm. And I'm, you know, I still say to this day if somebody had said to me on the 8th of February 2010, tomorrow you're going to leave and you're never going to go back. I would have said that's absolutely ridiculous. There's no way I can't leave because mm. I knew what would happen. And then, um, unfortunately, you know, I'd been struggling for two years and speaking quite openly about how. So, yeah. So Sorry, we, we just lost a bit of the vocals there. You, you got to the point you say you were speaking quite openly about how, and then I think it froze. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I was speaking quite openly in the religion about how I wasn't coping very well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was considered a high risk lever for quite some time before I eventually left, even though I had was not thinking of leaving at all. I, it, you mm -hmm. know, it wasn't an option really for me. Um, and then we went through the whole process or went through the whole process of them sending me to a psychiatrist saying that they thought that I was bipolar and I should go and get checked up. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think I'm bipolar, but thanks anyway. And they said, no, you really need to go. We're going to send you to Dr. Blacker at the Priory in Bristol. That was the That's same. Yeah, that you saw, wasn't it, Ross? Yeah. yeah. So how did you get on with Dr. Blacker? Well, there's a story that I've never told. Go on then. <laughs> um, I I went I you know, I, I said to I said to them before 
I said, look, if you really want me to go, I'll go. But I really don't think I have bipolar. Mm. And it turned out I didn't, actually. Mm. Um, mm. And Dr. Blacker actually wrote in his report, and I, I read it, but I didn't keep it, unfortunately. It said I can categorize, at the end of the report, there was loads of writing, and it said at the end, I can categorically mm. state that Stephen is sane. Mm. And mm. Not, I guess mm. not, many, not many people get that accreditation, do they? <laughs> I can't believe you threw that accreditation away. Come in useful. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I didn't throw it away. I never. I, I was never given it to keep. Oh, right. I, I was allowed. I was allowed to read it, and it said something about while Stephen has a lot of material, I can categorically state Stephen is sane. Um, and I had two one-hour sessions with him about a week apart, and I went into the first session thinking, "Yeah, I got this. I'm just going to be honest." Mm. And within minutes, my brain was fried. And he was asking me thousands of questions, jumping along my timeline of my life from when I was a little child to what happened last week to what happened when I was 12 and then 18 and then back to three again and then up to two months ago, whatever. And I can, I mean, that's why they do it, I guess, that I was completely fried and I was just saying, I didn't even know what I was saying by the end. Mm. It was just all coming out. And uh, bearing in mind that this guy was being paid a huge mm. amount of money to almost exclusively see brethren patients mm. all day, every single day. I think it was £500 an hour. That's about right, yeah. Yeah, and he'd been doing that for several years by the time I went. So considering what was on the line with him, by the end of the second session, and he was dressed all in a white suit, and he was quite old and frail, mm. and he jumped up at the end of the second hour session and strode across the room, opened the door with a flourish, and said, Stephen, you're free to leave. And my brain was just in like a fog. I couldn't even really realise what was going on. I just heard him say it, and I turned round. And I went, oh, great. And I got up and literally kind of stumbled across his office and slouched out past him, stood there at the door. And he was, I'll never forget it, he was stood there with his hand on top of the door like that. And there was this long corridor leading from his, from his door. And as I walked down the long corridor, I was just in an absolute daze. Mm. And somewhere out of the fog, I heard Stephen. Stephen, Stephen, and I stopped and I turned around and realised it was him calling me and I turned around and I said, what? And he looked at me, he nodded his head and he said, you've got to leave the brethren. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. exactly what you said to me. Really? Wow. And yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I just, and I just looked at him and I just said, I can't, I can't. And I stumbled off. I went downstairs to where my sister was waiting to pick me up. So just to put this into context for people who don't perhaps, you know, outside the brethren who listen to this, at this point you were married with two children and presumably your livelihood was dependent on the brethren? Yep. Yeah, and your housing or was that independent of the brethren? Uh, well, no, my house was, I bought my house when I was 21, but I had to put my wife on the mortgage when we got married. Yeah. Yeah, so it was jointly owned by you. So the consequences, the thought of leaving the brethren is basically that you would lose your wife, your children, your extended family. That's what you knew would happen if you left. That's presumably. A, it was a lot more than that. I would lose my wife, my children, my family, all of my friends, everyone yeah. that I knew, because you're not yeah. allowed to be in contact with people outside yes. other, than, other than for business, yeah. and my house, and my cars, and my job everything the world as i knew it yeah would come crumbling and how old were you at this point the 32 at the point of going to dr yeah. blacker and 33 yeah. when i left a few months later i think it was about yeah. five months later yeah yeah um, and yeah it was it was horrendous and things got worse and worse and when they couldn't pin bipolar on me uh they said to me we think you've got a real problem you need to go on antidepressants. So when you say they, is that the brethren elders or is it your family or who, who is the 
Yeah, the, the priests, the elders. The priests, the elders, okay, who would be visiting you to try and help you. And I put help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, again, I said to them, I don't think I've got a problem. I just think that I'm deeply unhappy. Mm. And they said, well, you need to go on antidepressants. And if you don't accept that you need to go on antidepressants, you've got a much bigger problem than what we thought you had. So just to pause it there, these priests had no medical training whatsoever. They had no training in psychology or diagnosing yeah. disease. I'm not so sure about that. Right. <laughs> I think yeah. they've all got very, very good training in psychology. Well, maybe they have, but not 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 the traditional training in psychology, a very right. unique training. And yeah, I think you could be right there, Stephen. And then they are suggesting that what's going to sort you out is antidepressants. Yeah. And how common do you think that is in the brethren? I don't well, know. I think you'd have some experience of this, wouldn't you? Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how yeah. many people were forced to take antidepressants like I was, but I know that a lot of them were on them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I suppose m many of us were on them because, like you, we didn't think we had an option to leave and we were trying to cope somehow. Um, yeah. But I, I didn't even want the antidepressants. And I said mm. to them, I said, I don't want to go on antidepressants because I've heard it's really difficult to get off of them. Mm. Um, but if you're telling me that's what I've got to do and there's going to be a problem if I don't, then I guess I'll have to be submissive and go on the antidepressants. And so not only did they put me on antidepressants, but they told I was going to say forced, but they didn't, well, I don't know if they forced or not, but they told my wife she had to physically give me the tablets every day and stand there in front of me to watch to make sure that I took them. So, so how did they get hold of the antidepressants or did they send you to the doctor? I mean, this, no is, a, this is actually quite worrying because it's an aspect I hadn't heard of before. So, so they actually gave you the antidepressants. Oh, well, my wife, well, my, my wife got them somehow. Um, mm. And after taking them for, I don't recall, a period of time, maybe a month, mm. <clears throat> they said that I was obviously still wasn't happy. And they said that, well, you just need to, you, we only, you only started on a very low dose. You should increase the dose. And... Uh, when that day came, it was very shortly after that they told me I had to increase the dose. And I knew what what was what the end goal was going to be and that I was just going to end up a cabbage. I would either I would either end up in an asylum or dead. Mm. Mm. Um because I, I, I hated my life in the religion and i couldn't cope i was literally down to you know minute by minute hour by hour just just trying to breathe and get through mm. hating my life loving my kids and my wife of course but um mm. and on that day i don't know what happened like i said the day before if somebody had asked me i'd have said no way would i leave or could i leave or did i want to leave and then the next day um somebody got married laura freeman got married and um i came home i can't remember if it was a morning wedding anyway it was an unusual day so there wasn't really it wasn't church in the evening and i came home and i was just driving around around gloucester i just didn't want to go home and i think subconsciously it had started to dawn on me and by the time i and then i ran i rang fred who was the 67 year old bloke that used to work for my uncle that I got on really well and has still stayed in touch with. And he's um, non-brethren just to, he was outside. Yeah. 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 He's never been anything to do with the brethren. Yeah. And I rang him and I just said, Fred, it's over. I, I just can't do this anymore. And I said, so I'm still in my work clothes. And he said, go home and get changed and come round and either talk about it or don't talk about it is entirely up to you and 
so I did go home and um, it must have been quite late by this time because the kids were already in bed and my wife was in the kitchen downstairs mm. and I went upstairs and got changed and I can't even, can't imagine what state my brain was in when I got a Tesco carrier bag and put three pairs of boxes and three pairs of socks and one t-shirt in it as if as if that was going to help me and I knotted the top opened the window and threw it out onto the front lawn and then I went in, into the ensuite um and leant my head against the mirror and I remember like I used to get searing pains across here like somebody had put a a cheese wire into my head the pain was incredibly intense and i realized then and it really only then that this was it i it was the the end of the line as you uh, as you may say and i found myself climbing through and sitting on the edge of the window and the cool breeze in my face and I never forget thinking this is what suicide feels like yeah. because I was departing one life and going into another yeah. mm. but I never hesitated or thought about it and I didn't walk through the front door because I couldn't without causing a massive drama because as soon as she had heard mm. the front door the door handle because remember everyone was on high alert mm -hmm. for a long period of time before I finally left mm. at, at least a year. And any time the door handle went, she would have shot straight through and grabbed my arm and said, where are you going? What are you doing? And mm. if I said, I'm, this is it, I'm leaving, there would have been lots of tears and I'm sure there were tears afterwards as well. But um, <clears throat> I just didn't, I wasn't doing it for attention. I wasn't doing it to try to, make somebody feel sorry for me i just wanted to go quietly without any fuss mm. you know um the cry for help had i'd been telling anyone that wanted to listen for the past two years and nobody really i don't know whether they really understood or whether they cared or what happened but i didn't get the help that i needed um and uh, and i jumped out the window and got in one of the cars and drove around to see Fred and never went back. Wow. Mm. And dare I ask, what happened? <laughs> they found you'd gone? I have no idea. No. No. I have. You've, never, you've never gone back? You've never? Never. Oh, I tried. I tried. Mm. Um, because uh, they did allow me Obviously, they were trying to get hold of me, and I mm. just I'd turn my phones off and everything, and I just didn't want to know. Mm. Um, and it was maybe a couple of weeks. I, I literally can't remember. Um, eventually, I was in contact with them, and they allowed me to go back to the house um, to see the children a few times. And I hoped that was how it was going to be, and I remember playing with the scale electrics with the children and my wife was crying and I thought, well, what, why can't we do this? Mm -hmm. I yeah. love, I lo and I said to my wife, I said, I didn't leave the religion. I, sorry. I, I didn't leave you. I left the religion. Yeah. 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 And uh, that's why I'm still single today. Cause I still love her, you know? Mm. Yeah. Nobody, nobody will ever replace her. Mm. Um, and obviously it kills me every day um, not being able to see my kids. Yeah. But I was very naive in thinking that this could continue, that I could see the kids and play scale electrics with them and take them to the park and live a separate life. I think I think we do we do think that, don't we? And there's that hope in us. And yeah. if they give us any little olive branch we hang on to it thinking this is this is going to be okay it's going to be okay and then they just drop you again you know and i think it's yeah it's all a ploy to try and get us to go back 
Absolutely. And and I I would have I would have stayed. I I would have even I would have continued to live in that house with them mm. with as long as I didn't have to do anything to do with the religion religion. But this is where, as I know it's been said before, the manner in which they practice separation is so wrong. And, you know, we get accused of being against the brethren, against their principles of separation. I don't think any of us are, are, of us particularly are. We probably all attempt to keep separate from evil. But what happens is it, the bottom line is because one member of the family decide that that church is not for them for whatever reason, the family mustn't know them. And that's the bottom line, the harm we're trying to address, isn't it? You know, it, they talk about being a mainstream church. If one member of the family goes to Church of England and the rest of the family don't, the family doesn't fall apart. They live as a family. They respect that that one member goes to church and maybe the other partner doesn't. And it's that that they're missing, isn't it? It's yeah. that the harm they're causing. And I find that it's sort of ironic because the whole reason that we're doing what we're doing is for that very reason. And Just that reason. The, the yeah. more we seem to highlight that, the more they seem to turn against us, you know, it's just, mm. they don't get it that it's no. that. No. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, I, th I think they let me see the children like three times or something. And right. I was quite upbeat, you know, this is, this is cool. This is really lovely. I'm still getting to see my kids and maybe something can be worked out. And then of course, all of a sudden out of nowhere, they said, the kids don't want to see you anymore. Oh, yeah. Mm. And how how old were your children at that time? Ten and eight. So ten and eight year olds have the ability to understand they don't want to see their daddy. I'm sorry, they don't, do they? They don't. They they no. haven't got the emotional maturity to know what's going on. Bless them. Well, maybe they do when they've been told so many bad yes. things about me. Yes, yeah. that's exactly the point. Exactly I, will never, I will never know what they were I will never know what they were told about me but um one thing's for sure I didn't leave for the bright lights of this world I was scared stiff about what was out here I just I left for I left because I knew that I wasn't going to survive in there or I would end up in an asylum which is neither of those options are helpful to my children either no. no, I think you, you're probably echoing what a lot of ex-members feel, that the bottom line was you left because, if not, your mental health was deteriorated to such a state that you don't know what you would have done. And mm -hmm. I don't think you're alone in saying that. I know, I'm sure you felt like that at times, Anne. And Gilly, you were quite frank about how you felt at times, and um, okay. Ross as well. And I think it is... Mm -hmm. So that's the bottom line. It's um, that choice between going on with it or literally spiralling into a mental abyss. As you say, you don't know where you'd end up. Yeah. Yeah. But at that, at that point, when you're at that point of leaving, you do almost feel a bit crazy, don't you? My, on, listen, my mental health was in absolute shreds. Mm. Yeah. I mean, what can you imagine? Why would I put three pairs of boxes and three pairs of socks and yeah. one T-shirt in a Tesco yeah. carrier bag? What good is that going to do? My yeah. brain, my brain was just was, not functioning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can I can yeah. I ask Stephen? Was it was the conversation ever um, had with your wife about whether you'd leave as a family or was never. It not? never, never, never. I, I never, ever asked her to leave and I never tried to influence her to leave because I knew that she wouldn't be able to survive in the outside world. Mm. Right. Mm. We, were shut up, we were shut up in 2006 for 10 or 12 weeks and she was just in bits every day missing her dad and mum. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's tough. And then a year after I left, and this is the bit the children probably don't know. Uh, well, I'm sure they don't. A year after I left, um, my I was really struggling in the outside world, and I was not integrating with society well at all. Um, I really couldn't cope, 
and it it definitely wasn't ever from a financial situation um i just couldn't cope with the whole the way that the world was and the way that people were and i think i probably ran into some not very nice people and that kind of mm. thing um i mean i wasn't keeping company with bad people it was just my experience of the people that i met through other people i guess mm. yeah um, and also when you first leave you're very trusting of everybody as well aren't you because you talk to mm. you know you you live in a in a um in, in a sphere where everybody everybody knows each other and therefore you you know trust everybody so you tend to take that into the outside world when you first leave That's yeah what I very, yeah and very that is the upbringing we all had it it leaves you it doesn't equip you for just a basic knowledge of people in life so when you do leave it's not a case of getting in with wrong people or right people or good people or bad people. You don't have that knowledge of how people can be because the only community you've ever mixed with, people have all been the same or have been tried to be the same, haven't they? Mm -hmm. So you don't have that diversity of different characters. And that's what can make you feel so at sea, isn't it? You don't know quite how to handle this influx of um, yeah. that's hitting and, you. Yeah, and like Ross said, not only... Um trustworthy or trusting yeah. people but also completely naive yeah mm. yeah unbelievable yeah. looking back on how naive i was, it was i think we all cringe at that one <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry you're yeah. you're gonna say Stephen, a year after you left. yes so yeah so a year after i left i wasn't coping with life out here and i did something that basically I wanted to go back and I said that I wanted to go back and I I can't remember what I did. I posted something on Facebook mm. because I wanted to do something that the outside world would see that they knew that I'd gone back and that I couldn't reverse it. So I could I couldn't go back into the world if that makes sense. So I had to continue that journey to get back in because I I was so worried about being able to do this cat and mouse journey of them playing with you psychologically and all the hoops you have to jump through and being held in that vacuum for an unknown period of time where you're not allowed to live in the outside world. You have to live in a house somewhere that they put you in and basically just do your job and stay at home on your own for an unknown period of time and sometimes that can run into two or three years and I knew that I wasn't strong enough to be able to do that and I would just be a mess and I'll be back in exactly the same back in square one basically same place where I started and so I posted this on Facebook to basically shut down my life in the outside world. And I drove to Gloucester and knocked on the door of my parents' house. And my dad came to the door and could see that it was me through the frosted glass and he wouldn't open the door. <laughs> and I said, I said, please just let me in. Just let me come and stay with you. I'm done with this world. And he well, it wasn't actually him. It was my mother screaming from the background. You need to get clear of your sins. And she was screaming at the top of her voice like a, a banshee. And it was, it was a, a terrible time. Anyway, they wouldn't let me in. And then my mum screamed through the window that I've called the police and I've called the, uh, and I've called the priests. And as soon as she said that, I knew that probably the priests would turn up before the police and they would no doubt push my buttons. And I haven't, had a, I haven't had a fight since I was 16 years old with my brother. I'm the least aggressive person in the world. And yet I knew that they would push me over the edge and I'd probably end up hitting them, which is what they want me to do, so that I'm then in a big ton of trouble. So I jumped in my car and I left. Um, and then I was back in touch with the priests and... Um, I don't want to name his name, so I'm not sure how I can carry on to telling the story. Anyway, uh, one one of the, my priests in particular 
um, I was in more contact with, like on the phone and that kind of thing. And three times over the period of several months, three times I tried really hard to go back. And every time I went back or, or tried to go back, um, he kept on blocking me and basically ridiculing me. And it was never when anyone else was there or listening. And they got me to go to one of their premises and I sat there for three and a half hours and told them every little sin I'd done since I was born. Um, some of the stuff which I'd never said and I was crying my eyes out for three and a half hours. And then a couple of weeks later, I was on the phone to this one um, priest and he said to me, the, the problem with you, Stephen, is you don't go deep enough. You read your, you read your sins out like a shopping list. Oh. And I said, what are you talking about? I was crying my eyes out as a grown man for three and a half hours, telling, going over every single little thing that I'd ever done wrong. And now you're saying that I read them out like a shopping list. What do you want from me? Mm. Mm. And uh, they said, we have to smash your own will into a million pieces so that you never, ever, ever do what you want to do ever again. I'm speechless. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I just. <laughs> and so, I mean, I was, I, 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 I pretty much gave up for. I can't remember a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And then I got back in touch with them again and said, look, I really want to, I really do want to come back. I'm missing my kids so much. Um, please just tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. And I was on the phone to this same priest, so I won't mention his name. And he laughed at me down the phone. He literally went, ha, 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 ha. You don't want to come back. And I said, and I quote, word for word, because I remember it like it was five minutes ago. I said his name, and then I said, I want nothing more than to be back among the brethren. And he laughed at me again and said, you don't want to come back. And it was seven years later that I found out why. Ah. Uh Mm. his son yeah, okay. his son married my ex-wife yeah. uh, I, I just I don't know how you take that Stephen I, I really don't um, mm. you think that was the design all along well my ex-wife's younger si youngest sister mm. also left the brethren yes um, about seven years later and she contacted me and said I'd really like to meet you for a coffee. I've got some things I think you need to hear. Mm -hmm. And she sat me down and said, ever since practically the day you left, his son was courting the affections of my sister, your ex-wife. Wow. And, and that same priest, my ex-wife's now father-in-law, even came to the courtroom to see my divorce go through, to make sure it went through. He was sat at the back of the court, and in court, I stood up and I said, um, Your Honour, I do not want to get divorced. Mm. Reconcil reconciliation is the only thing on my mind and in my heart. And the judge said, I'm sorry, Mr Gear, it's far too late for that. And he was sat at the back of the court, watching it go through and get it rubber stumped. So this is probably a really silly question, but I want the answer. How do you cope with that? How does that make you feel? Chuck it in, the, mean, chuck it in the box <laughs> and throw away the key. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to open that box too often, do you? No, no. I mean, that is, you know, the, the, I think the point about that, it's this, this is happening in somewhere that is professed to be a caring compassionate christian community and it's that it's it's not what happened is bad enough stephen it happened i'm not belittling it by saying it happens this 
th things can happen in life, yeah, that are pretty bad. But when it happens in a community that wants that external portrayal of being a caring, compassionate community, and yet underneath they're carrying on like anybody else in this world they're taught to hate, aren't they? And it's that that you... Yes, but, you know, I I do actually be still believe 99.9% .9 of the members of the Brethren are really decent people. But I don't disagree, yeah. And for, but unfortunately, those the few people that are in power are an absolute nightmare. Yeah. 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 And not being made to be accountable in any shape or form. I think that's the, you know, they, they as you say, you, you mentioned this priest who obviously seemed to have ulterior designs on what he was doing with your life in such a devastating way. Um, accountable to nobody, I assume. Nobody was checking on him. Well, I did. I did hear that he actually got a priestly visit himself because of the amount of time and attention he was giving my ex-wife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now this is getting even darker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just devastating, though, isn't it? We laugh, but it's not funny. It, it's devastating. Absolutely devastating. Um, and then, so that's sort of uh, seven years after you left that happened. Yeah, and weirdly it, enough, weird, weirdly enough, um, whenever I bump into any brethren at yeah. um, exhibitions for business, which which yeah. I do um, quite often in my industry, um, most of them look at me like it, with a fleeting glance of absolute horror as if i'm a murderer yeah yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. for years and years and years up until probably about a year ago my i, I would i i'm constantly scanning the pavements when i'm in public for brethren without mm -hmm. even realizing it so that i can avoid them because i don't want to be looked at like i'm a the plague mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and every single time any of them actually went out of their way to speak to me, which was quite a bit risky on their part, mm. and they would always do the whole patronising, oh, you know, there's always time there's for you. There's a way back. There's a way back and all that. And yeah. they, they, would always, they would always play the card of superiority, of... Mm. Uh, like it's such a shame, you know, you could be in a much better place and all this. And it only occurred to me a year ago, mm. I'm actually not going to be, um, I can't remember whether I was scared or, or um, ashamed of the situation or I just didn't like being treated like a piece of stuff on the floor. Mm. But, and I thought, I'm not, I'm no longer going to um, allow them to speak to me in this way and if they do want to come up and speak to me i'm going to absolutely and i've done this several times and it is great therapy and if they make the transition to come into my personal space to talk to me you know within about three steps away you know that they're going to come to talk to you and as soon as they do before they start speaking i always i'm, I'm always polite and, and nice to them um, but I, and I always say to them, really nice to see you. I feel so sorry for you guys trapped in there. <laughs> if, yes. only, if only you knew what it was like if the tables were turned, you would never stay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're, they're in shock horror. They're like, what, are you bitter? No, I'm not. I'm not in the slightest bit bitter. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not angry. Uh, if anybody should be bitter against the brethren, it should be me. Mm. Having my wife yeah. and children taken mm. away from me yeah. and preventing mm. preventing me, yeah. not, not twice, but three times preventing me from going back yeah. just so that his son could marry my ex-wife is absolutely horrendous. Um, mm. But I'm not bitter against the brethren. Um, that said, it's it's much more fun to turn the tables and feel sorry for them. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's a really key point, actually. I think when you 
leave, we all know that those of us have left have a stigma attached to us. And we all know that nothing good about us will be said amongst the brethren, which is really hurtful when it's to your children and so on has been said. But doing what you've done, it empowers you. It takes that control away from them, doesn't it? Yeah. It's saying, you know, I'm OK. And actually, yeah, I don't like the way you behave towards me, but I'm OK. I'm doing OK. And my mental health is sure better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. I mean, my mental health, I've never taken antidepressants since the day that I no. left. No. Um, and my mental health is the strongest it's ever been. And yes. I'm in a really good place in life. Um, yeah. And somebody said to me the other day, you're so lucky. You know, you've got a great business and you're doing great. And you've such a, you go to all these amazing places, do this amazing stuff. And you're here, there, and everywhere. You have an amazing life. Mm. And I looked at them, and they were very, very close friends. So, you know, I felt like, like I could. And I, and I said, but I will never be happy. Mm. And they sort of laughed and said, oh, much wants more. And I said, no, it's not about that at all. No. While my kids are prevented or while I'm prevented from seeing my children, I can never be happy, not truly happy. Mm. Mm. And it's, sorry, yeah, go on. Um, and it, it's not, it wasn't, I wasn't talking about anything to do with materialistic things, which mm. of course they were. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that sort of made them sit up and, and realize really that, you know, it's not all about money and life, which I'm very fortunate to enjoy a nice life, but um, it's, it's not that my children mean so much more to me. Yeah, no, you'd empathise with that, Anne, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say that somebody said that I, I thought was good that it's this a deep sadness that we carry with us, but it doesn't mean that we're not happy in our lives, mm. but we just carry that. That'll never go away, you know. That isn't, you don't move on from the loss of your children, your loved ones, you don't. But, but you learn to live with it don't you and yeah, it, but that, it is that exactly it's exactly deep sadness mm. yeah that is you're absolutely spot on that's exactly what it is yeah it's that, exp it's that expression isn't it one of the hardest things to grieve is to grieve someone who's actually still alive yeah yeah yeah, yeah. because in theory they could be in your life there's no the the, the, the barriers for them not being and not the fact that they've passed away yeah. are they they're, they're there they're alive they're yeah yeah, yeah but it's always Go on. Sorry, I do always try and turn that round to say, well, where there's life, there is hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I never give up hope. Never give up yeah. hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see, you see, I can't, I can't and haven't allowed myself to hope. I right. cannot, I cannot live my life every day thinking, oh, they didn't leave today. They might leave tomorrow. It would just eat me alive. I have to come to yeah. terms with the fact that I'm never going to see them again. But obviously, I do hope underneath. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't think about it every day or anything. But I just have this this hope within me. You, yeah. That that like, that. I just. Yeah. One day. This, I mean, if it doesn't no. happen, it might be my grandchildren. It might be my great grandchildren. I don't know, but there's just always that that bit of hope in me. I think I suppose we're all different how we cope with that, aren't we? Yeah. And yeah. that is something that that keeps me going. It's is, an interest. Yeah, it's an interesting one, yeah. Anne, because um, like like you said, you carry it for, for forever for our entire mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. um, but time is a great healer, and I'm yeah. not yeah. suggesting that the thoughts of my children will ever be healed until if they ever do leave but only just recently and literally in the last three or four months i found myself daydreaming while i'm driving or something and just thinking imagine if i suddenly got a phone call and my son or my daughter said that they'd left Wherever I was in the world, I would drop what I had or what I was doing and I would get on a plane or get in a car and get to them as quickly as I could. And imagine the afterwards. Imagine them coming to work for me in my business and, 
living with me or near me it would just be you know and I, it's only in the last three months that i've started to allow myself these thoughts which i never have done before so in the 13 years that you've left you, you said you saw your children two or three times in those early days yeah that was in the have you had months. first few months yeah have you had any contact whatsoever or any nothing no so um yeah i'm not too sure how much to say but um uh last year i decided that i wanted to send them a substantial amount of money um mm. and i contacted my brother by email and i said i would like to send my children some money and i didn't say how much i was going to send them and I said okay. it's a substantial amount of money um, and it, I'm not talking about £100. Mm. Um, and I also put in my email, also, I will not accept sending the money to a third-party account. I will only send it to their bank account in their name. Mm. And I waited probably two weeks without any reply because obviously it had to go all the way up to the top and then come all the way back down again and after about two weeks i got an email back and it didn't say hello Stephen." it didn't even say Stephen at the top the only thing the email said was please see below bank account details as requested the name sort code account number for both my children and there was no sign off at the bottom it was as cold as you possibly could be and so I, I i went to send them some money and obviously like most people i've got the banking app on my phone so i went, I went into the banking app because um i was i was out i wasn't at home i can't remember where i was but um and i went into the app and put in their new pe new payee details I went to send them the money and it wouldn't let me send it through the app because it was too much. So, and it said, you've exceeded your daily allowance and the daily allowance was £1,000. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to have to wait until I get home and then go on my laptop and do it through my laptop. And then I suddenly had a genius idea. I'm going to send them £500 each for weeks. <laughs> And, <laughs> and I had love it. I, I had I had nineteen letters or spaces as the reference for the payment, and I was putting my email address in there. I was writing little messages that led on to the next day, that led on to the next day. I, I have no, I have no idea where they live, no phone contact details, no email contact details, no way of getting in touch with them. But this was my only little connection that I could make yeah. through these 19 yeah. characters on the payments. Yeah. And, and I only sent the payments Monday to Friday. And this went on for weeks. And they must have thought, is this ever going to end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And did you ever get an acknowledgement of the gift you'd given them? No. no. Never. No. No. I yeah, tried it's to give tough. My children, I tried to give my children some when I sold the house, but... They wouldn't even accept it. Really? Wow. Why do you think that was? I mean, it's not. It's, it's, they love money. I was, I was just going to say. say I, I, well, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps they thought my money was unclean. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say. It wasn't pure. <laughs> yeah, the money for God, isn't it? So you would have thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. That, that's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. They wouldn't even accept it. Yeah. 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 So. You well, after you left the brethren, just to backtrack slightly, um, did you at that point lose your work? Because most people, as we know, work for the brethren, and as Gilly explained and Ross explained, when they left, they lost their work. What happened to you from a work front? I absolutely have no recollection. I know that I stayed with Fred for three days and three nights, and then he said, obviously, and I always felt compelled. This is going to make me sound bad, so maybe I shouldn't say that. But I always felt compelled when telling the story 
to make sure people knew that Fred had a wife just in case they thought that I was um, gay, <laughs> which I'm obviously, obviously I'm not. And, uh, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, obviously coming coming from such a homophobic background, um, that yeah. was, and I, I'm you not can understand that. Yeah, I'm I'm not homophobic anymore, but um, uh, I'm still very straight. Let's say that. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I I the three days I was with um Fred and his wife, and I was sleeping on the sofa, and eventually because they only got a one bed council flat, and uh, he mm -hmm. said, "Look, I'm sorry, we can't." put you up forever you know you're mm -hmm. going to need to move off and then i went on the website and i hit the emergency red button in the right hand top corner that used to be um and then i think wikipedia one or peeps.net peeps.net i think so the precursor to wikipedia yeah yeah and mm -hmm. so then i went i don't know whether i went straight but i went to stay with a couple that used to be brethren uh gins mm. uh mark and deb is it oh mark and yes. deb yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and, and uh, they looked after me really really well um and i stayed there for two weeks and after that i the whole that whole period of time is such a black hole i can't really remember what happened um I just kind of existed really and somehow survived and I'm here to tell the tale, but, um, yeah, eventually I then, um, went into business with, uh, it was a very bad, bad decision, but the only, the only option I had really went into business with a guy that I used to buy secondhand cars from when I was in the brethren. Mm. Um, and actually he used to supply quite a lot of, uh, brethren with their vehicles um and uh we were we went we started a business together 50 50 he put the money in and i did all the work which was what we agreed and after five years we were um making a lot of money and mm -hmm. sadly he decided that he wanted to keep it all for himself so he kicked me out of the business mm. And I lost everything in 2015, again, yeah. for the second time in my life. And then I um, moved to Spain for some sunshine and happiness. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Again, because, because of my mental health at that time in 2015, like, I... I I couldn't really see a way back from losing absolutely everything for a second time, only five years yeah. later. Yeah. And I was devastated and I knew it was cheap in Spain. And, um, I was kind of scrabbling around, um, still in the, still in the hygiene industry, um, scrabbling around being a bit part consultant and trying to, uh, while well, I was designing various products for various companies, um, mm. and they paid me for eleven months that I was in Spain. Yeah, um, and yeah. I live and I live like a king because you don't need to earn yeah. much to have a good no, living. Yeah, yeah. Spain. And then one of my ex competitors from the first business that I got kicked out of, um, he was a competitor of mine. Again, never anything to do with the brethren. Um, he contacted me and said, I haven't heard from you in a long time. Where are, you, where are you and what are you doing? And I said, I'm not in the industry anymore, the hygiene industry. I said, uh, I've, I've left and I'm uh, living in Spain. And actually, uh, I was working on a campsite in Spain as an entertainment manager, organizing all the, the shows. Right. And <laughs> I was also playing in two bands while I was in Spain one rock and roll band I play keyboard in and an acoustic band I play guitar in. And um, so he said to me, well, I've got some money to invest. What do you think about starting a business together? And I thought, here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing all over again. But mm. I took the offer because it was a better situation than what 
I was in at that time. And I thought, do you know what? Again, he's going to put the money in. I'm going to do the work. And at least this time, I'm going to go into this expecting to lose everything. Mm-hmm. And actually, I don't care because my the money that we'd agreed I was going to draw out of the business from day one was considerably more than what I was being paid on the campsite. Mm. Mm. So, so you I, had a living. Yeah, so I had a living. And yeah. I, I thought, actually, do you know what? Even if this all goes pear-shaped again, because I'm bound to get taken advantage of again, and I'm bound to lose everything all over again, and history's going to re- um, repeat itself, um, at least I'll go into this expecting that to happen and not have anything to lose in that respect. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. And uh, is that the business you work in now? It's the business that I own 100% now. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Mm, Fantastic. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Um, that second business partner was absolutely amazing. And mm-hmm. we, we never argued. We were in business together for four years. So it's yeah. just, coming, just coming up five years I've had the business now. And um, uh, I bought him out a year ago. Wow. So right. I've, I've owned the company 100% for almost a year now. And yeah. it is unbelievable. You know, every day I wake up yeah. and I just can't believe. I mean, you know, we've done quite well for ourselves, I suppose you could say. And we've, we've had some, we have had some good times and uh, made some decent money. And he was very happy because the original investment that he put into the business was a lot. It was a lot more mm. than, a lot more than the first guy put into the first business. Um, mm. And during the four years we were together, we actually paid him back all of his money and four times his original investment. Wow. Mm. Fantastic. And obviously the, the other three, the other three times we were both taking dividends because we were both 50, 50 in the business. Mm. And so mm. the other three multiples of his original investment, I was also getting as my, as my dividend. So yeah. it was uh finding myself in a situation financially that I've never been in my life yeah, and yeah. Um, mm. amazing. And um, I'm actually going to China with China with him in two weeks, two weeks time. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, we're not, we're not going, we're not going to the same factories because he's still in the hygiene industry, but he's, he has his other business in hand dryers. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm going to see my factories and he's going to see his factories, but we're going to, you know, meet up and go for dinner and um, we're going there together and we're coming home together. So we're, and we still, yeah. go, we still go for beers, you know, once yeah. a month or once every six weeks. Yeah. And it's amazing that good people do exist yeah. out here. Yes, <laughs> they do. And that's exactly what I was going to say about that, that, that uh, te- story you've just recounted. So often we know people in are told there's nothing out here. It's, you know, it, you, you'll never make it. Um, and I think actually what you've told us is an absolute testament that you can hit rock bottom, but you can go back up. And I think that's a big message to get across, isn't it? We, you know, we've, we've all been, yeah, we've rock all bo- been there. Rock bottom yeah. twice. Rock well, bottom yeah, twice. twice. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's something that comes out in a lot of people's stories that they're now telling on these podcasts is they've got to that absolute low point, real, you know, beyond low. But they're here telling their story and they've turned it around. And that can happen to anybody. Can't it? Yeah. I, I've I've had some I've had some really bizarre things happen to me while in the last thirteen years. I mm. I don't know why, why they keep happening to me, but um, for instance, when I got kicked out of the business the second time around, um, just before I got kicked out, um, and there's no need for me to go into the whys and how he he legally managed to manipulate the situation and he legally was allowed to kick me out by something he had hidden in the annual accounts um, that I didn't pick up on. Um, anyway, I, I knew something wasn't right about three or four months before he kicked me out and, and I just could tell something was wrong. We were making all this money and we were, we were doing so well and I was so happy 
And but there was just something that gut feeling. Mm. In, I knew something wasn't right. So I went to uh, Janine Wiltshire's um, uh, one of her house parties that she used to have, mm. um, and while I was there one time, um, she'd invited her new next door neighbours. And that was a guy called Owen Rothwell. Again, they're nothing to do with um, the brethren. Uh, okay. So Owen and Sarah Rothwell were at the party because they lived next door to Janine. And I was chatting to Owen and I immediately hit it off with him and just got on so well with him and saw them pretty much every time I went to one of these parties at Janine's. And it was only by the like second time I'd met him or something I just had formed such a good friendship with him that I felt able to express to him about my concerns about my business partner. Mm -hmm. um, and he said to me, well, it definitely sounds like you need some help, but I'm not the person to do it. Let me talk to my best, best friend, um, mm -hmm. Tim Kearns, who is also my boss at HR Owen, the largest mm -hmm. Ferrari dealership in the world. Mm. And then I, Owen rang me a few days later and said, oh, I spoke to Tim, and Tim said for you to come and uh, pop in to see him at the Knightsbridge Ferrari garage. <laughs> and we were in London. C couldn't say no, but yeah. <laughs> yeah Amazing. And, and I was like, that's yeah. really, really kind of you, but what on earth would he be interested in what's going on in my yeah. world? Oh, don't worry. Yeah. It's not. It's not like that. It's not like that. Just go and see him. He's a really nice guy. So mm. I did, and I sat there in his office in Ferrari garage in uh, Knightsbridge for three hours or two and a half hours, and uh, told him everything. And at the end, he said, "It's a fascinating story, Stephen. Um, I, I think that you're right to worry from what you said. I think there's mm -hmm. your business partner is definitely up to no good." Um, he said, "But." I think you need more of a numbers man. And I'm not a numbers man, um, but I do know a guy that is. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> something else. I'm yeah. just saying it's ridiculous. So he says, yeah. I'm having a beer tomorrow night with Adrian Martin. He's our, our financial director and sits on the board. I'm like, come on, this is absolutely ridiculous. Why is he going to be bothered about me? And he went, no, it's not like that. It's not like that. And three days later, I get a call. Adrian Martin wants to meet you. So what are you doing this weekend? I said, no, nothing. I'm happy to meet. And they said, um, Owen said to me, um, Tim wants you to go to the uh, Ferrari track day at Silverstone because Adrian Martin is going to be there. So I get to the track day, get led up, and I've got a parking space reserved for me and all this. And it, I'm totally out of my depth here. And I get led up to the VIP go through VIP, out onto the balcony that overlooks the start-finish line of the of the racetrack. And there, there at the end of the balcony is Adrian Martin and his wife. And he, I don't know how old he is, probably late 60s. Now he would be early 70s. And he looks like everybody's favourite granddad. He's yeah. such, such mm. kind eyes, such a lovely demeanour. And he, he only spoke to me for about three minutes. And what I found out later is he just wanted to look me in the eye, see if I was sincere. And um, then he said to me, anyway, we're here to enjoy the cars today. Here's my card. Next time you're in London, give me a call and um, we'll have a chat. So I called him, went to his place and followed the instructions and got there. It's the penthouse suite right next door to the Tate Modern Gallery on South Bank. <laughs> I, go, I mean, the apartment must have been worth about £10 million. And I go up to the top floor and it's plate glass window from floor to ceiling. And you look out over the whole of London. You can't even see the Thames. Oh, we froze at the wrong moment. Just getting into that. <laughs> no. <laughs> you froze Sorry. there. Sorry. That's all right. Carry on. You, we, we, but, we couldn't see out of the Thames. I was well into the... Yeah, I mean, it got the imagery there. <laughs> yeah, so you could see right out over London and you couldn't even see the Thames because the Thames was so far below and we were so close to the Thames. Anyway, yeah. and he chatted to me for like three hours and went over everything and he said, I want to help you. And I said, that's really kind of you, but why? 
I, I, I have nothing. I've got no money because all my money's in the business. I can never, I, I can't afford to pay you anything. And he said to me, Stephen, it's not about money. Sometimes good people do good things for good people. Mm. And that still yeah. makes still makes yeah. the hair on the back of my neck go up. Yeah, yeah. And he was a um, a chartered accountant by trade and a founding partner in London's biggest accountancy company for most of his life. And he was also financial director, sat on the board of the big yellow storage company. Financial director yeah. sat on the board of HR Owen, the world's biggest Ferrari dealership. Um, and also, financial director sat on the board of a two billion pound construction company. So I'm just completely, I'm still in awe, by the way, but um, absolutely amazing. And such a lovely guy, so, so decent. And, uh, and anyway, so I, I was like, okay, it's really kind of you, thanks. And so he started ringing me and emailing me and texting me. And I was replying to him and telling him over a course of a few weeks or months. Um, and uh, then he said, right, I've got enough background from you. Now I'm going to ring your business partner and ask him without provoking him if I can come in and have a chat with him that I'm just helping you and I'd like to help your business. Mm -hmm. And it was very shortly after that that he kicked me out because he, he knew he wouldn't be able to manipulate Adrian. Mm. And when I, a strong ally. Yeah. And when I and someone that knew what he was talking about. And when I got kicked out um, of the business on the 10th of December 2014, um, I rang Adrian in tears and said, he's done it. He's handed me a, a letter and claims that I owe him a lot of money, which I didn't, but legally I did because he'd hidden it in the accounts and I hadn't mm. seen it. Um, and uh, Adrian rang me back and said, hi, Stephen, sorry, I was in the middle of a board meeting with the Big Yellow Storage Company. As soon as I heard your voicemail, I told them I had um, urgent matter to attend to, and I'm in my car, and I'm on my way to Siren Sester to come and see you and talk to you. Wow. In the middle of a massive board meeting to come and talk to me. And uh, we then went to a court case that dragged on for 15 months. It was horrendous in the High Court in London. Mm -hmm. And every single day from Monday to Friday, Adrian Martin either rang me or emailed me or sent me a text. Every single day, this guy is working in businesses worth billions. And he's messaging me or calling me every single day for 15 months for no money. How, how, big, of, how big of a comparison is that to the man at the top of a cult? <laughs> well, I was yeah. just going to say, how much care did he show you compared to the priest that was supposed to be looking after you so many years ago? Yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 and I think that the, the message to anyone inside who's listening, for the one bad person or you met in business Stephen who did the dirty on you or whatever or left you high and dry you've met how many that wanted to help you I yeah. mean that's three you mentioned just in that story oh yeah, they, yeah there's, there's so many good people, people. Mm. yeah and, and um but it didn't stop them so um Adrian actually advised me I think rightly so he said mm -hmm don't get another job in the industry while the court case is going on because it will affect you. It will affect mm. your court case. Mm. And so I went seven months without having a job when I've never been out of work for a day in my entire mm. life. Mm. And work has always been my passion. And I was just at home doing nothing, going round the bend. Yeah. And, of course, getting deeper and deeper into debt. And I said to him, Adrian, I can't even pay my rent next month. I, I'm up to the limits of my overdraft. I'm I've got to work. And uh, he said, he said, uh, don't worry, Stephen. You'll be able to pay your rent next month. I don't even know whether I should say how much he put in my bank. Mm. 
it mm. was let's just say lots of tens of thousands way more than i needed to pay my rent mm. um mm. and i i just i just cried i just couldn't believe it and mm. um and then at the same time i was playing tennis for Sirencester in the Gloucestershire County League at the time and had done for like the last three or four years up until that point. And um, I became very, very close friends with the three guys that were in my tennis team. And one of them, they knew what I was going through because I was in a mess. And one of them came round to my apartment, well, te- sent me a text and said, oh, are you, are you in? Can I call in for a cup of tea? I just wondered how you, how you were. And of course, I was not in a very good place. And I said, sure, yeah, come in and uh, put <coughs> made him a cup of tea. And he's driving uh, a 20-year-old VW Passat mm-hmm. in a scruffy anorak. Lovely, lovely guy. And funnily enough, he this guy knew my father because he used to do the um, plumbing work at my dad's business many years ago. Um, and he said, I just wanted to make sure you're okay because I'm really worried about you, Stephen. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I said, I'm not sure. I said, no, I'm not fine, actually. Um, I've got to the end of my overdraft. This was this was like a couple of days before Adrian put the money in my account. Um, <coughs> and uh, and he said, um, "So, but you're still not working. And I said, no, because Adrian's advised me not to work. And yet I've got to the end of my overdraft and I don't have a clue what I'm going to do. I suppose they're going to evict me. And he reached into his pocket and he... I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this even, but he reached into his pocket and he took £5,000 cash out of that pocket, (laughs) £5,000 cash out of that pocket. And he said, he said, it's entirely up to you. You can take one, you can take both, or you can take none of them, not neither of them. And I said, because obviously I didn't know about the Adrian money thing. I said, I, well, I I don't know how long I'm going to need it for. So, if you don't mind i'd like to take both and he said to me i will never ever ask you for it back i will never chase you i will never charge you interest and i don't want you to sign any paperwork Mm -hmm. he said all i ask is that you pay it me back when you can Mm. yeah and it took me quite a few years and you know what i paid both of them back every single penny and it gave me it gave me so much pleasure to do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. a prime example, isn't it? Both teach you that you know everybody out here if they do something for you, they want something in return, and it's, it's just a, absolutely not the case at all. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I think it's illustrate what you've told us has illustrated that beautifully. Yeah. It's um, yeah. people genuinely want to help, and when you're in a position to repay that help, you needed that help at that point in time. Yeah. And when you got into a position to repay it, you could gladly do so, but they never asked for it. They yeah. didn't expect no. it. They didn't yeah. make you sign to do it. There was no conditions attached to it. Nothing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And the same was with Adrian. Um, and when I realised, and, I, and I, I said to him, like, that's just that's so kind of you. Thank you so much. Mm. And he also never asked me to sign any paperwork, never, ever charged me interest on the money, there was no ulterior motive and he never ever chased me to pay him back although with him it was slightly different because the amount was so much bigger mm-hmm. um i did pay him a monthly payment over yeah. the several years so that it was slowly chipping down yeah but, so it just dropped a little bit yeah yeah and, yeah. Then, and then of course we did we made a lot of money in uh 2020 and 2021 mm. and um mm. i was able to pay it all back in a lump sum but um, that's fantastic yeah I, but I always... contra- sorry Stu. i was just gonna say in contrast to that um i was in the priory and the brethren lent me the money and they wanted paying back asap no questions asked and you know it just shows the total you know difference between people out here and people in there mm. Yeah, and yet they tell you that everyone out here is horrendous and evil. Mm. And yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 
And I, I always affectionately refer to Adrian Martin as my angel in a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. yeah, Angels in Ferrari are good, eh? Yeah. Um, well, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. We really do appreciate it. And I think it's um, you're a true testament to resilience. Really are. You really are. There is just one thing. You're still here and you're still smiling and we won't keep you much longer. But there was just one thing I wanted to ask you, um, because obviously you've still got that hole in your heart where your kids are and so on. If by any remote chance your kids ever saw this podcast, what would you want to say to them? It's a tough one, isn't it? Very tough one. I would just want to say to them that I still love them so much it hurts and it mm. hurts me every single day and I will never ever stop loving them and I hope one day that they will be back in touch. I, I think we, we all I, that. Yeah, I, I, again... I would never want anybody to do anything that they don't want to do. So like with my ex-wife, I okay. never tried to influence her to leave okay. and I never, I never asked her to leave. And I, I wouldn't say the same thing if my children contacted me, I wouldn't no. try to influence them or, no. or no. even ask them to leave. I, no. I would just be very thankful for a phone call to be able to speak to them and to yeah. tell them how much I loved them. Yeah. yeah. And I think that summarises the feelings of all of us, really. It's it, it. We're not there to pull people out, the brethren. We're not there to say, get out of that place. If they want to stay there, that's fine. But we are here to say, stop tearing people's hearts apart by dividing families. Yeah. And I think that's it, isn't it? Absolutely. Stop yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'd echo that, wouldn't you, Anne, who've also got children? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's all we want. Mm. Yeah, totally. Stephen, thank you so much for sharing that. I know some of it was very heartfelt and we asked some quite probing questions there. Um, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me.